The latest mass abduction of students in Kaduna State shakes schools, parents and students. What is the fate of education in Nigeria, which already has the highest number of out-of-school students worldwide? Lawmakers in the United Kingdom to debate in Nambi Kanu's repatriation today. And also coming up is a review of today's papers, a preview of two events in history and much more. We'll say good morning and thank you for joining us on The Breakfast on this very, very beautiful, cold, I think I can say cold, Wednesday morning here on Plus TV Africa. I am Osao Yi Ogmawa. And I am Aneta Felix. Beginning with our first top trending story today, we know that the United Kingdom Parliament would debate in Amdekana's repatriation to Nigeria today, Wednesday, the 7th of July, 2021. Um, the conversation about Nnamdi Kanu is not over, very far from over. His trial date is, you know, much later this month. There's still lots of talks about, you know, IPOB, his lawyers, his family, alleging that Nnamdi Kanu was actually abducted from Kenya and that there was no smooth, classy uh, operation that, that, you know, that was held. There was no repatriation. We had Ademola Akimbola on Off the Press a few um, days ago explaining that this is not a repatriation. It was a rendition. He explained that, you know. So the the controversy about an Americano's arrest is still a point of discussion. And now the UK has waded in because we know that an Americano was in fact traveling with his British passport. And we have a statement here. It's a document um, from the UK. It says, Lord Alton of Liverpool would ask Her Majesty's government what assessment they have made of one, the alleged role of the government of Kenya in the detention and alleged mistreatment of Nigerian activist Namdi Kanu. Now, this is coming because Kanu's lawyer, Ifan Yujofo, had alleged that Namdi Kanu's um, special forces in Kenya had arrested, detained, and tortured Namdi Kanu, and that's before handing him over to the Nigerian government um, days later. So um, this Lord Alton also said he would ask Her Majesty's government to um, basically determine the circumstances surrounding the transfer of Namdi Kanu to Nigeria against his will. And also, they would ask for assistance to be provided to him um, by the High Commission in Abuja. So um, I asked this question before on the breakfast. What impact will the UK's involvement in Namdi Kanu's case and trial be? And it seems that it's still a very valid question because we're seeing more moves by the UK. They're sitting on this matter today. And we're going to see what, what exactly they resolve from that meeting at Parliament. Well, let's also yeah, wait for um, you know, the end of the uh, uh, Parliament uh, discussions today and uh, see what they, they come up with. You know, I, I think I said it yesterday that you know, I'm not sure exactly how much power they would have you know, in his case, you know, he is Nigerian, he's also British, you know, has uh, dual citizenship. Um, but, you know, I think I also need to you know, read a little bit more about international law to, to see um, if they um, have enough powers, you, they have, you know, enough rights as he is a British citizen to ask that he be um, freed. If there's anything like that that is on the table, or they would only just question uh, the role that Kenya played and the role that Nigerian, you know, officials also played. Uh, did he have proper representation by the, you know, Nigerian embassy? Did he have proper representation by his lawyers? You know, was he moved back to Nigeria um, 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 against his will and some of all of that? So those are the questions that I believe that they would ask, you know, but after those discussions are, you know, had, uh, what next? You know, are they going to be asking that he be sent back to the UK? Are they going to be asking that uh, they send a representative uh, who, you know, stays or who stands for him um, as a British citizen here in Nigeria? Um, I've also always mentioned that uh, countries always would act based on their interests. Um, um, and um, regardless of how our emotions are on, on certain issues, countries would always put their interests first. So what, what do you, you think, know, so. you know, the interest of the UK might be in the Namdi Well, interest... State. Well, Is it because it simply holds a, a, you know, a, you know, a UK citizenship? Is, I, do you so think maybe so that's I, I don't why? know if that is big enough. If you remember the, um, the guy, the WikiLeaks guy, um, and the controversies, uh, yeah, um, um, and controversy surrounding his extradition. It took a while, you know, but there was also some level of interest here and there, um, you know, from the United States and from other countries that were somehow involved in the case. Same thing with um, um, Jamal Khashoggi, who was murdered in uh, the Turkish embassy 
uh, by um, Saudi Arabian um, hitmen or officials from the Prince of Saudi Arabia. Um, there's also that, you know, he is, of course, he was a writer for the Washington Post. So you'd expect that he, you know, American interests will be very, very strong there, you know, because he, you know, has some leverage in the United States. But how far did they go with it? You know, Donald Trump basically just made a few statements, said he didn't think that the prince um, was involved or Saudi Arabia was involved, you know, and, you know, made some, some you know, very, very, you know, bland statements here and there. And that's where it ended. Um, well, but I, if but I think was, the circumstances um, there would have been different if Jamal Khashoggi was alive. You know, he... No, it's he, even he worse was, that he's. Was, it's even he worse found. that he was killed. He was murdered, um, yeah, and I mean, in a very, very I'm gruesome manner. I mean, what else can you do? The person's gone. So no, yeah, it doesn't matter if you kill an American citizen wherever in the world. They would, you know, represent and they would, you know, place sanctions if possible. They would take action. You know that you've killed an American citizen. It is different. It's even worse that the person is dead, whether you know, um, um, uh, you know, he's a citizen or not. A person has been killed, has been murdered, and so it's it for me. It, it is worse, but. Um, at that point, the United States had to consider their relationship with Saudi Arabia, and that's what the bone of contention was then. Turkey, of course, um, was furious. The president of Turkey, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, was very furious with the way that things played out. But the United States in, this, in the question here didn't seem to be very, very moved or didn't seem to want to get involved to not to tamper their relationship with Saudi Arabia. So it's pretty much, I feel, pretty much the same thing that will play out here. The UK's relationship with Nigeria, their interests with, in Nigeria, um, how much you know, do they want to tamper with? If the Nigerian government says, oh, this is our um, suspect and you know, we'd like you to back off, you know, what, what's the UK going to do at that point? Um, and that's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. So they you know, might question Kenya, they might you know, make certain statements you know, with regards to Kenya's involvement, but I don't know how much you know, involvement they would like you know, to have and how much interest they really have in all of this. It is not expected that they would say they would stay silent. So yes, they will make these statements. They will bring it up in Parliament. They will discuss it. But after that, what next? It also makes me ask questions about where the loyalty of the UK lies in terms of you know this divide, you know the Nigerian state and the separatist agitations for Biafra. We know about how the UK had extended a soil asylum um, for members of the IPOB, even though the letter went on to correct those statements on their website. Well, the fact that it put that out in the first place showed that maybe they have some sympathy towards the IPOB and, uh, you know, in, in, totally in support of any group of person who wants to break away from their state. We know, we know how they have their own battles with Brexit. So maybe they're open to say, you know, people should have the power of determination. So it also makes you ask, you know, if the UK has to choose alliances between the IPOB and, 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 and Nigeria, it seems to be tending towards the IPOB. I mean, they're speaking in now and standing in now for Unamdikanu. I mean, for Unamdikanu to be such a big deal that it's going to be a subject to be debated at plenary today, you know, questions there need to be asked. Yeah, I, I agreed, you know, but it also is very dependent on the country you're speaking of. Does Nigerian government seem like a government that would care to listen to whatever the UK, you know, parliament says? If they decide that they are going to fully be behind him and they're going to you know, take what steps are necessary, does the current Nigerian government seem to care that much? Um, you know, we, we've heard statements from Abubakar Malami and from the Minister of Information many times, uh, you know, kicking away or denouncing any other thing that any, any country in the world has to say because Nigeria is a sovereign state and so they would act as a sovereign state. So, True, um, there's also that. Yeah, so, so yeah, they, they will, you know, make whatever statements they would debate it in Parliament, but... I'm not sure what happens next, you know, right after that. Okay, so, um, well, right after that, we're talking about the police in Nigeria. The spate of, you know, kidnapping, abduction of school children doesn't seem like something that would leave, uh, you know, our, our political discourse anytime soon. And what's worse is the reaction of Nigeria's law enforcement agencies to parents who are grieving, parents who are mourning, parents who are demanding that Nigeria security agencies go in and rescue their children. I mean, we played this report yesterday about parents crying, crying their hearts out, and, you know, saying that the police were shooting at them. I saw people on the floor. I have no idea if they were shot at. But parents, you know, had carried olive, olive um, basically, the olive branch figuratively, but they carried, you know, um, the stem of trees and stem of, you know, with, with, with flowers, uh, basically saying that um, the who just want to um, protest, ask the government to rescue their children, they're not with arms, and if the federal government wants to um, basically clamp down on anybody, it should be terrorists, and, you know, asking them to go to the bush to, you know, met out their strong arm of the law 
on those terrorists and just let the parents be. So this, this situation, uh, we've seen it happen time and time again. Remember when, I can't remember his name now, but one of the uh, men we had him on the breakfast, he was the father of one. Um, mm. he, had, he actually had two kids who were kidnapped at that time. And they had traveled all the way from the north to Abuja. And that's basically to demand that their children be released. So that's the video you're seeing there. Um, we hope we can, we can you know, play that soundtrack for you. The parents basically asking that they simply want the release of their children and they should not be shot at. So why should, why should the police be shooting at parents who are protesting for the release of their children? Well, uh, it's, it's two, two points, you know, that I would uh, throw in here. The first one would be for the parents themselves. Um, I, I remember growing up um, uh, in Benin and I don't think, you know, and I'm not blaming them. You know, this is, of, this is absolutely none of their fault. Uh, but I would just quickly also mention it that I, I don't think, you know, in today's Nigeria that any parent should willingly open their eyes and let their children go to any school in, in Kaduna State or in Northern mm. Nigeria in general. Um, so if you decide to take that risk um, and believe that your children are safe in whatever school that they're going, then I'm, I'm not sure because we've seen that the Nigerian government has not been able to fully protect these school children. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's too much of a risk to let your children go to school in Northern Nigeria today. And this is not calling for, you know, schools to be shut down, but if that's where we are, then maybe those are steps that we need to take. Um, that's, that's one. And then second, uh, the Nigerian police obviously has a lot of lessons that they need to learn with regards crisis management and um, with regards dealing with people who are aggrieved. We've heard stories of uh, persons who went, you know, to a police station or who uh, were upset with, you know, a certain case, you know, losing a family member and eventually still got shot by the same police uh, who was meant to be defending them. We've heard stories like that before. Um, so there, there needs to be, and it's one of the reasons, um, you know, why the NSAS protests held and some of the demands, some of the things that Nigerians expected would be, would, would be the uh, fallout of all the protesting in, you know, 2020, October 2020, that the Nigerian police would understand that aside, you know, funding, uh, the police better sites training uh, the police better there has to be a lot of training with regards you know the, the crisis management and the hum humane you know aspects of policing um, in Nigeria they seem to not have that and sometimes you look at Nigerian police and wonder whether they are actually from Nigeria or they're dealing with the same issues that Nigerians are dealing with because their their reaction to protesters their reaction to people who seem to be aggrieved with the government makes absolutely no sense whatsoever I don't know if there's any human being that works with the Nigerian police force. Um, shout out to those people who say, oh, my dad has been a police officer, he's a good man. I don't care about you and your father. Um, the, the human angle with regards to the Nigerian police force seems to be completely missing, and it's sickening. Yes, um, so yes, what you're seeing on your screen are basically um, videos of... Um, okay, we'll get more clarity on that, but we know that... Closely related to this particular incident is a bill that actually sitting now, um, lawmakers are proposing a five-year jail term for anyone who protests. So if this scales through, these parents who are protesting the release of their children would be in jail. Right. That's what's, you know, that's basically the, the, the meat of the story. And it, it was sponsored so there's a, it was sponsored by Representative Emeka Chinedu Martins, um, representing PDP Emo. So he's basically proposing a five year jail term for unlawful protesters in the country. This is scaled through first reading at the House of Representatives. There's still a few more hurdles for, it, for this to jump, but if it does pass, if you protest that there is no light, and you've not had light for the past 10 years, if you protest that the price of fuel in Nigeria is too expensive, if you protest that your kids are being kidnapped, you might go to jail. So what is the Nigerian government really saying to us? If you're not protecting us, and you're asking us not to speak up about it, I don't really understand how, how you can then call this a democracy. No, I, oh, I also don't understand what is a lawful protest and an unlawful protest. Um, exactly. <laughs> where, where do you draw the line with which is lawful and which is you know lawful nobody's going to be protesting good roads 
No one is going to be protesting 24 hours you know, electricity supply. No one is going to be protect, uh, protesting um, higher uh, minimum wage. <laughs> so what exactly would you describe as lawful? And uh, there is still a court ruling that allows Nigerians to protest without having to seek permission from anybody. Um, from the police. I think it was Femi Falano who got that role in a couple of years ago, um, you know, with, you know, the same government that is in power now. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what exactly they mean by lawful and unlawful protest. Um, then maybe they need to explain, you know, a, a little better what exactly they mean by lawful. So, so who is a lawful protester? Is it those who are protesting pro-Buhari? Are those the lawful protesters and then the ones who are wearing, uh, wearing Brahma's are unlawful lawful. protesters? <laughs> is it the ones who come as a oh as counter protest that we always see that they give 500 naira or 1,000 naira to protest? Those are lawful protesters. And then the ones who are complaining about things that they are dealing with in society are suddenly unlawful protesters. It's a shame. I don't know who that guy is. Shame on him. Um, and... Um, Ooh. Let's take a break I really here. need to calm down. Yes, we, yes, we need to take a break here. Um, Mr. Ademola Kimbola, publisher of the Podium Media, is standing by to help us make sense of the stories making headlines. Do stay with us.